Welcome to Inspired Edinburgh, the home of powerful conversations. I'm Elliot Reeves and my guest today is Stephen Sharp. In 2002, at the age of 12, Stephen was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel condition, Crohn's disease. Since then, you've raised in excess of £12,000, you've been named a community champion for Crohn's and Colitis UK, and you've had an enormous amount of celebrity support from the likes of boxer Ricky Hatton, football manager Alex McLeish, wrestler Kurt Angle, actress and model Linda Lusardi, and football legend Neil Razor Ruddock. You've also featured on the radio, in magazines, in the press, and on television. And when you're not raising awareness of IBD, you're managing youth football team Fodhouse United. I hope I've got that all right. Stephen, it's an enormous pleasure to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. It's really brilliant to have you here. And, um, you know, I've done a, a, a bit of research on your story, and it's, I have to be honest, it's, it's really remarkable. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's, it's something that a lot of work goes into it. Um, it's a lot, of, a lot of pride into it as well, um, everything. Um, but it's something I felt I had to do. Hmm. Um, I had to do raise awareness. Um, I wanted to get involved in football. Yeah. Um, as you said, said I've managed um, Faltish United. It's, I manage Eastwood Mairns in Glasgow now, but I used to coach at Faltish United. I got you, so, okay. so um, no, but it's um, it's a progression thing, and it's it's about trying to do as much to help for me to help others. Yeah. We, we have them. So. Which is brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. And I really look forward to getting into it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If we can start um, just kind of going back, you know, the early days for mm -hmm. Stephen Sharp, what was life like for you growing up? Where did you grow up? What were your circumstances? Do you know, I th it's strange. Um, a, lot of the, a lot of growing up has kind of been blanked out. So being younger life, sadly, uh, I don't... I don't know if it's just because of lack of observation, but uh, um, I, I don't remember a lot um, of life before I attained quite ill. Mm. Um, I, strangely, I, I don't. Um, I kind of just really remember from the age of probably primary seven onwards. Um, I know you don't always remember a lot from when you're really young, but mm -hmm. um, for me, I, I don't. I don't really remember loads you remember bit parts um and i was just probably a general child growing up <laughs> probably getting told off by the parents and just being a general rascal really yeah <laughs> um but i don't really the, the thought process and my memories really start from something big like getting diagnosed with crohn's disease yeah yeah. So, so how did that initially come about? What were the the symptoms and, and yeah, how was um, it identified? I don't think it was myself really that that, that um, noticed. Mm -hmm. um, I was I was passing blood um, while going to the toilet, and any time I would wipe myself or clean myself after the toilet, I would see some blood. Mm -hmm. But I just thought it was maybe a little cut or, a, or something. I, I never gave it any thought process. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that my mum my and my dad, um, who were together at the time, noticed that I was passing blood. So they made sure that um, I got an appointment with the doctor. And um, the doctor at the time, um, who's sadly no longer with us, um, he, from the first onset of going in and seeing him, mm -hmm. he... Um, said there and then after examining me and the sim the sim we told him about passing blood and um he said straight away i think you've got something like crohn's disease which back in 2002 mm -hmm. wasn't as well spoken about and as as common as you like as what what it is now definitely yeah yeah okay you know crohn's and colitis inflammatory bowel conditions i mean we hear about these terms a fair bit at the moment mm -hmm. but what is crohn's disease how has it affected you Crohn, crohn's disease is inflammation of the bowel crohn's disease can can affect anywhere from the mouth mm -hmm. to to your to your backside to to your your um right down your backside so yeah from your mouth to your backside um it causes ulceration um it, it can cause your, your fatigue you can be drained you can lose a lot of weight you can struggle to keep food down you can be running the toilet several times a day it's a very very and i know i always try and be positive about it but if truth be told it can be a very very horrible condition for people to, to try and live with mm -hmm. it can have a major effect on um both yourself and, and people around about you um and it, it can 
not just with the, the physical symptoms, but in my opinion, the psychological um, effects yeah. can be can be quite deep. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's something that the charity and all that are now trying to say, look, people are sh struggling here. They're invisible illnesses. We need to make them visible, whether it be raising awareness, whether it be unfortunately telling people this is what it is. It look, doesn't look great. Um, this It's not nice things to talk about, a little bit of a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. But I think it's, a, it's came to a stage that you know, people are suffering in silence here. We need to speak about it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, what was the impact that it had on you when you were diagnosed with it? Diagnosed with I was actually okay at the start. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was pretty, I, I felt pretty, I thought it was going to be a case, I take a couple of tablets a day, mm -hmm. uh, you'll be fine. It's just a Mickey Mouse condition. It's not, re it's not, it's not diabetes, it's not cancer, it's not, it's not, yeah. it's not anything like that. Mm -hmm. It's just, I've never heard of it. So if I've not heard that and it's not on the telly, then it's nothing. Mm. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> obviously it, um, it, it was, and I started off on my own medication and I, I think I was okay. Mm -hmm. I, I kept relatively okay. And then after a while, my body would reject the medication. And then I would get moved on to something else, and then I lost a lot of weight. Then I put a lot of weight on because I was on steroids. Then I was on liquid diets, and I was on new medication. Mm -hmm. And I firmly believe at my stage and my age that I was, um, and the way the condition was at the time and the way they treated it, it was a lot of trial and error. It was, we're going to try this with Stephen. It's we're going to try this because I started off living okay with it and then it progressively got worse and it got worse and it was a probably a tester for the for the staff and that at the sick kids because they were seeing me coming through the cycle which a lot more people have probably came through the cycle since then yeah. um but I, I would live so long um doing okay on medication then my body would reject it and then i would become ill again and that was a cycle um right up until i was, I was 17. really and that was the cycle I would be doing so well. Um, I would be like the Michelin man because I was on steroids. Mm -hmm. I would be like the Weeble Wobble, but I would never fall down. <laughs> <laughs> and then the next thing, I was like a skeleton with a jacket on. I was stick thin. Um, mm -hmm. At one point, you could physically, and this is no word to lie, I could physically wrap my fingers round my waist like that and they Jeez. would touch. At one point, I think I was about seven stone at the age of 15. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not exactly, for someone that's six foot, it's not exactly a, an ideal weight. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. Yeah. So when you were, I mean, how much were you attending school at that time? I struggled. Um, did you? Yeah, yeah, yeah I struggled. I'd done, I done, I done my exams in fourth year. Mm -hmm. um, but then fifth year and sixth year, I had to rely on prelim results. Mm -hmm. It was a case of, like, we'll get Stephen in and do his prelims when he can. Um, yeah. The school, Whitburn Academy, were um, amazing. I get quite emotional actually thinking about the what what that school done for me. Mm -hmm. um, the, I mean, schools always get a lot of negative publicity nowadays, that, or youths and all that. And no, that school, that school bent over backwards for me. Um, mm -hmm. Probably because it was new for them. They, they, they were seeing this lad coming in with feeding tubes and. One month he'd be coming in, as I said, like the Michelin man, yeah. the next minute he'd be stick thin. And they're seeing that and the, 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 the work they'd done to, to support me. I mean, I was going into school um, sometimes at half past seven in the morning because I knew come two o'clock I would need to go home and go to bed Yeah. Um, because I was so drained. Mm -hmm. um, but that school, what they'd done for me was the they trained the, the school nurse on how to feed me at lunchtime with a feeding tube and... Um, staff, staff, just, I don't know, they, they, they seem to take a, 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 take me under the wing and be like, you know what, we're going to do everything to make Stephen feel normal. Because yeah. if I'm honest, I didn't feel normal. My friends were going out and it sounds terrible, but they were going out and doing things that normal teenagers do, play football in the park, drinking at bus stops. Come on, everybody's done it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> not, not me. I was, I was going home from school and I was lying in bed and I was basically slowly, slowly distancing myself from everything. Mm -hmm. 
and the school seen that, so they they made sure that um, they were there for me when I was in hospital getting surgery. The staff, numerous staff, came in just to split up the time for me, just to probably done things that nowadays would get classed as unprofessional, mm -hmm. like give me your phone number, Stephen. I'm going to give you a call. Um, when, when I'm free, just to see how you're doing and, and if there's anything we can do to help you. Nowadays, that would get classed as unprofessional and we shouldn't be doing that, mm -hmm. but it made me feel like a normal person and it made mm -hmm. me think, do you know what, people care. Yeah, yeah, brilliant. Yeah. At what stage um, did, or was the decision made that they had to do something more severe? Um, well, I... They went with medication right up until... I, I got kept on at the sick kids. I was like, the, the kid that got, got kept behind at school, um, they didn't want to give me up because they'd started things and, and you become very, very attached. Um, my consultant, um, David Wilson, who's now a professor, um, absolutely amazing guy. Um, Pam Rogers, my IBD nurse, the, the two of them were nothing short of phenomenal. The mm. support they gave me and my family, again, they don't see it, and I've spoke to them since. In the last few years, I've spoke to them about it. They don't see they're doing anything out with the norm, but they were. Mm. They were. And it was, I, I was becoming, I was get, then getting the transition period to go to the Western, and it was just near that stage that um, I remember it like it was yesterday. Like I'm saying, I remember, I remember that period more than I do when I was a lot younger. Yes. But I remember um, them sitting down and... Um, Dr. Wilson was there, Pam was there. Something wasn't right. Something was not right this day. There was something just weird. Um, the, the expressions on their face, I'm thinking, are you two okay? And without a word of lie, they were getting emotional. They, you could see and they were like, Stephen, it's for us. We've done everything we can Me um, from our medication background. Mm -hmm the only way for you to get any quality of life and for, for it to go forward for you is you're going to have to need surgery. And they were they were probably, the emotion from them again showed me, do you know what, these people care. Yeah. And they've been with me since I came through these doors in 2002 until 2008. They've been so close. To, like, like, we, I would, at some points I was seeing them every second week because I was so ill and I was having to go in and we were having to readapt the, the medication plan and um, so it was then that they said, look, we're going to get you in to see um, the doctor that, the, at the Western to introduce yourself to them and then we'll have a, probably a six week period or a four week period of building you up, trying to get you stronger for this operation because it's major surgery you need to go for, so we need to bulk you up. Mm -hmm. um, they had to put me on this drip that was 2,000, this bag was 2,000 calories in it itself, um, just to try and fatten me up, to, to get me strong to be able to make it through um, the surgery, because I was very, very weak. I was, I was, my body was shutting down, mm -hmm. I was, I was a skeleton, I, I just, I look at pictures, I, I, I've got pictures of when I've done my work experience standing next to Walter Smith, and I look at it and I go, God, that's, that's scary, that's me, mm -hmm. um, that is me, I, I look so different, um, but you can tell, even taking away the tube, you can tell just by looking at my, my skin colour, I, I, was, I, was, I was ill, yeah. and, and it was then that they said, look, we're going to have to, to look at surgery, and, and that was the transition period, so mm -hmm. it wasn't a case of, like, that's you now, you're now going on to the adult clinic, take care, it was a case of, we're now you need to move on to the adult clinic because you're, you're at that age, but you're moving on as well because it's now time you need surgery. Um, yeah. Which the transition was happening anyway, mm -hmm. but it wasn't a case of right, they're just going to take over the medication plan. It's like you're going there now because it's surgery time for you. Yeah. This is what you need, um, and 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 that's how it happened. And it it happened very very quickly, mm -hmm. um, but it happened smoothly as okay. well. I was made to feel, because it's a big step. You're at, a, you're at a children's hospital where they put their arm around about you, they, they do everything for you, 
Yeah. Whereas you're going into the big bad adult world, it's mm. like it's like leaving school and going into employment. Yeah. It's a scary process. It's uh -huh. like whoa, one one minute I'm I'm getting my lunch put down to me in a tray, and the next minute <laughs> I'm going to have to go out and buy my own lunch. <laughs> <laughs> What's this all about? <laughs> um, and it's it, it's that type of thing. But the transition. But it was it was the age of seventeen that it was like no, it's time to. Yeah. We need to operate. It's not a case of do you want to. It's we need to operate. Yes. Yeah. What was the nature of the surgery then? At that point, we didn't know. Um, mm -hmm. they, they turned me in, they assessed me, the, the usual MRI scans, all the, all the whatnots. But they basically told me, we're going to have to remove some of your bill, but we don't know what and we don't know how much. It's a case of when we open up, we need to, because we know it's severe, mm -hmm. we need to see how severe it is when we open you up. Um, so we may be able to take some of the bowel away, reattach it to your tail end, and, your, and um, you'll be able to go to the toilet normally again, and we'll do that. Or we may have to remove a large part and leave you with a stoma, which is a, a bag that the waste goes into. Um, I never gave it much thought because I was so ill. I just, my thought process was, I just didn't, I didn't know what day of the week it was. It was, I was just living day by day, mm -hmm. hour by hour, just try to, try, try to motivate myself to get through it. Um, I was always a kid at school with a, a smile on my face and pleasing everybody else, but deep down I was I was probably struggling with it, but I wanted to be positive for everyone else, because that's the type of person I am. Um, and um, went for surgery, and it turns out they did have to remove the full large bowel and leave me with a bag. But I didn't know that until I woke up um, through surgery. It was a case of waking up and looking and going, oh, I've got a bag. Right, OK. There's no point in... I can't move at this point. <laughs> I'm lying. Yeah. I'm lying on ketamine. I'm on morphine. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm <laughs> on, uh, on the moon. Um, yeah. Just take it as it comes. Um, it might only be temporary, but it turns out throughout down the line, um, it turns out it wasn't going to be temporary. Um, it was going to be for the rest of my life yeah and so what's your your earliest kind of memory of realizing that that's how it was going to be that what your rest of your life was going to be um i, I always in my head had that uh, they might be able to reverse it because they always told me there's possibility give your insights a chance to sit the information to settle down because with Crohn's you're never cured so they can remove an, a really bad inflamed part Mm -hmm. but you're never cured mm -hmm. so it can appear that any other part from your side for your mouth from your from your backside to your mouth can yeah. appear at any time um so i always had in my head and then i came back from a holiday and there was a there was a bit of issue with the stoma there was a fistula which has caused a hole so i had to go for more surgery and then two years down the line so 2012 so 2010 i went for more surgery so it was like a two-year cycle and then a further two years, um, I was kind of passing blood again through my to my, my tail end, even though nothing was coming through, everything was coming through the bag. Mm -hmm. I was passing blood again. And they basically said to me, we need to remove your back passage because you are potentially, if something lies not working and, and active, there's chances of cancerous cells and things like that building. So mm -hmm. as a precautionary measure, if you want, we can remove your tail end and your back passage and that's when I knew that's me um it's like Tesco you pay 10 pence you get your bag for life <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have this bag for life and um it was a no-brainer for me though um did I seriously want to have my back passage here that was doing nothing and risk potentially 10 15 20 years down the line just saying or you've got um, cancer down there. Yeah. No chance. No chance was I having that. So um, I had to go and get surgery for that. And that's when, so 2012, age of 22 or whatever I was, that was when, boom, that's, I'm going to, I knew it. I always knew it, that I was going to have this for life. I just knew. But then that was like the final, like, you're going to be, unless medical science comes and, yeah. They invent something dramatic and they send Americans over and they do this to me. Mm -hmm. Then I'm going to be, that's, that's going to be me for the rest of my life. Um, 
But until then, I always kind of thought in the back of my head, do you know what, maybe be able to get it reversed. But deep down, I knew, because you always get vibes and things, you get vibes and things in life, and anything, mm -hmm. not just, and you know your body, and I just knew that I was going to be stuck with this. Yeah. Um, it's not all doom and gloom, it's definitely, it's, it's, it's kept me here. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's, it's just a complete change of life, really. Absolutely, yeah. So what is it like now when you reflect back on everything that you've been through in terms of a, an emotional journey? What is it like reflecting on it? It's hard at times. Mm -hmm. um, you try and stay positive. You probably try and stay positive for the wrong reasons. You want to be the big, oh, there's Stephen. He's always happy. Mm -hmm. He's always happy. And I don't talk about it very often. That's why I'm kind of glad that we're discussing this. That mm -hmm. Stephen's not always a happy boy. <laughs> He's not always. Stephen does sometimes go home from work, from the football, from life, and go, do you know what? This is hard. This is extremely hard at times. This is just rubbish. But in the same breath, you've got to rein it in and go, what's rubbish about it? Why is it hard? Mm. Why? Look at the positives. Look at, the, look at what it's done for me. It's done so much for me. Mm -hmm. um, it's made me do, like, do things that I would never, ever have imagined this today. I mean, if I hadn't had this journey, then this would be good. Well, what did you do early if I went to the swing park? <laughs> it's not, exa it's not yeah. exactly going yeah. to motivate or inspire <laughs> anybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, looking back on it, you, you do think, and you don't ever look for sympathy, but you rein look at it and go, what a journey. Not just I've been on, but the people around about me, my mum, my dad, my grand, my auntie, my full family, the, the journey they have been on, and you think, I've put them through the mill. <laughs> that's that's not in the that's not in the manual when you have kids yeah. that um, you're going to yeah. have to go through. Oh, that's not the perfect <laughs> manual. That's like out the window with that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah, I, I always think like that. I always think, how's it affecting other people? I, I tend to always people that know me and know me well know that I look to make sure everybody else is always okay rather than me. Mm -hmm. um, I'm happier seeing someone else happier sometimes than me being happy myself and it's a, it's a weird way to look at life and hmm. um, it's a strange way to look at life but I'm pretty sure I'm not the only person that looks that way but it's just me, yeah. it's just, it's just yeah. the, way I, the way I do things. <laughs> what do you think are some of the biggest positives to have come out of it? The biggest positives are it's made me the person I am today. The things that I've done, I've done my work experience at Real Radio, met Walter Smith, I've done television work, mm -hmm. radio work. Um, oh God, I went to the, the opening of the Scottish Parliament and met the Queen. Yeah. That doesn't happen every week. I mean, well, it's like, you met the Queen, what did I do? Did I shake her hand or lick the back of her head? Because I've only seen her on a stamp. It's like, it's like what, do, what do you do? It's like, I've never got it. But I wouldn't have got that opportunity if... Um, if I, if I hadn't had this condition. Yeah. So, yeah, it's not great, and living with a bag is not great for someone at my age, but would I have got all these wee perks and got to do things that people can't imagine? I mean, people go their full life never having done, like, been on the TV, or they maybe have been spotted in the crowd at the football, or walking down the street when uh, when the guy for STV is standing doing his interview outside Tesco. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there's, there's been someone knocked in, blah, blah, blah. There's someone stealing turkeys and <laughs> and there's people going past the camera. But this isn't real. Like me, I got invited down to the television programme Soccer AM through the charity work that I'd done. And mm -hmm. That's no real life. <laughs> that's just, wow, it's just a... A lad like myself, living the dream, really, getting to do things that and meet people that I never would have if I didn't have the condition. So I, I find that a positive. Yeah, I really do. Definitely, definitely. You've done incredible work around raising awareness yeah. of, of these conditions mm -hmm. and fundraising as well. Tell me a bit about that. I decided um, I had a long period off. I got a gastro bug um, a few years ago, around about about 2000 and 2014 
And I was really ill. I was, I was off work for seven weeks. I lay in bed and I was insomnia kicked in because that's part of it. You can't sleep. You overthink things. You worry. You stress. And really hard factors to deal with. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to do something to make a difference. I'm going to use my time. I'm lying here in bed worrying about everything. I'm going to put my thoughts in and, and try something. So where I stay in Fault House, um, we've got such a great, great community. A small village, village mentality, but we've got some unbelievable talent in regards to singers. We've got we've got Paige Turley who came was in the semi finals of Britain's Got Talent. Hmm. We've got Gary Gregg who um, was on the X Factor, mm -hmm. um, got to the, the boot camp stages. We've got loads of great. I think Robert Whiteford, UFC Robert Whiteford, Fighters, Fault House, yeah. from Fault House. Yeah. Um, so for a very small village, um, we're very very. We've got the talents in the yeah. label. <laughs> so what what I done was I thought, right, I've got I've got Facebook, I'm gonna use it. I'm gonna send them all private messages and go, look, I'm looking to organise a charity event, um, hold it in the welfare, it'll be a Sunday, there'll be ten or twelve different singers, we'll get raffles, we'll get loads of different wee things and we'll help make a date. And we organised that. I got local T V, uh, online T V at the time to come along. Um, they came along and filmed the full day. <laughs> um, they brought along Sandy Clark, who's now the um, assistant manager at Dunfermline. Nicky Clark, who played with Rangers and is now playing with Dunfermline, they came along and done the raffle for me. Um, bit, of, bit, of, bit of a celebrity exposure. That's, that's always going to be better to highlight it with somebody well known rather than Joe Bloggs like myself, that, that probably nine times out of ten people wouldn't know walking down the street. And what an unbelievable success. We had 12 singers there, all doing it free of charge. Um, we had a hall of 300 people with some amazing raffle prizes, donated donations, um, all, all done by me just contacting people at standard, box standard email, sending it on, sending hundreds of emails, hundreds, hundreds of emails, just can you help? And there was loads that got ignored. But there was all the there was the ones that creeped to the top and that, that 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 helped out and you're just like wow, and that first one we raised four thousand pound, so the the event started at like three o'clock on the Sunday, ended at ten o'clock at night and we raised four grand, and you're just like wow, because <laughs> for me it it sounds terrible, and a lot of people would think I've got the wrong mentality with it, but it's not about the money, it's not about the money, you could go and raise two quid. A fiver, that's not. But if there's people coming away from that event understanding what Crohn's, understand mm. what colitis is, I'm not asking them to be medical experts, but mm. if they know a little bit more than what they knew when they turned up on that day, mm -hmm. then happy days. Yeah. Um, and if that can help something that something that audience might be suffering the symptoms that I went through, and it might take an event like that to highlight it to them for them to go and get checked, yeah. and then take it from there. And yeah. that's that's the, the, the aim for me when I'm doing this stuff is awareness raising. Funds will for me will come secondary. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people that do fundraising to raise money and that's great because it's needed and it's it's amazing. Yeah. But for me, if I raise five grand or five quid, it's about the awareness that is raising for people and for people get a, a little bit of a better understanding of the condition and what people like myself and other younger kids, adults, a lot are going through then, and that's what I want it to be. Mm. Brilliant. Great stuff. We were speaking off camera before, and um, you basically were talking about the fact that you were very nearly not here. Yeah. How has mm. that um, changed the way in which you actually look at life now? Yeah. Um, after, after my operation when I was 17, um, the surgeon... Uh, his name was Mr. Wilson as well, and fantastic guy, but very, very dry sense of humour. Um, but I think you've got to be when you're removing people's bills. You've got to have some sort of dry sense of humour. You're, yeah. you're going to have to have some sort of um, release mechanism anyway. And he came in and he says, um, yep, I've done a good job. Oh, well, I'm glad you think so. Eh? I'll, I'll be the judge of that. He says, uh, you'll be glad that I've done that, though. And I'm like, 
Yeah, it's like, because if, if I didn't, you wouldn't have seen your 18th birthday. I'm like, wow. Mm -hmm. That was Easter. Um, my birthday's in August, so you're talking four months. And you're like, wow, that's a bit... But you, didn't, you don't think it at that point. Mm -hmm. You put that to the back of your mind. It's not until you get a little bit older and you're, you're talking to people and you're telling, you're like I'm telling my story to you now, that you think, God, that is quite serious. <laughs> that is um, very, very serious. And that's why now um, I try and, and I'm probably, I'm probably the worst advocate of having something like inflammatory bowel disease because I'll go out at the weekend and I'll drink alcohol, I'll have bottles of wine, I'll do this, I'll do that. But do you know why? Because I'm trying to have a normal life now. Mm -hmm. I didn't have, when my friends were all going out and starting a relationship with girls and doing all that, that you do in your teenage years, mm -hmm. your wild years. Mm -hmm. I didn't get that. I was, it sounds horrible. I was robbed of those years of my life. Mm -hmm. I'll never get them back. And it, it kills me. It pains me at times. And, and, it, and it frustrates me. And I think I see, I see a lot of people that I went to school with and they've moved on and they're, they're, they're married and they're maybe went to university and things like that. And I, at that point, when they made that journey in their life, my focus was just being here, just mm -hmm. surviving day to day. Um, and is there a jealousy part? Yep. But is there a, is there a manual on how you should lead your life? Hmm. No, there's not, because if there was, the library would have none of them because everybody would have checked it out. <laughs> yeah. Because, and that's what, that's what I do now. I just try and enjoy my life. And although it is still, there's times that I am pretty down in the dumps at times. And I try and be positive for everyone. There's times that I, I'm down and I'm, I'm not embarrassed to admit it. I don't admit it very often. Um, in fact, today's probably... Um, apart from one-on-one -on -one with people and people that know me deep down, they would probably look at that and go, no, Stephen's always happy. He's mm. always the life and soul of the party, the, the joke, laugh or the joker. Um, but sometimes it is an act. Not all the time. Nine times out of ten, I'm that laughing, joking, that bit of a rocket. Absolute <laughs> rocket. Uh, <laughs> but there is that small period of time that, that uh, there's a dark place mm -hmm. and there's the that this is just hard to deal with and I hit home probably the end of the end of last year with my gran who I was she was the closest person in my life my mum and dad are always my mum and dad but my gran was my gran and mm -hmm. um, we had a what a relationship we had it was like Jekyll and Hyde I mean we were like a married couple the two of us had to bicker and then <laughs> um, but she was the person that was up there and when I did have my down days, I stayed with her, so I'd come home from the football, have a bad result, and I would talk to her about it. She wasn't interested. She was sitting there on the couch. I was sitting there, and she was looking right through me to watch Jeremy Kyle or Law and Order and <laughs> uh, Norden, and, but she was there, and that was a major thing in, in December, and you think back, oh, but then you think, you look at it and think of all the positives you had, like, I had that relationship with her. I had mm -hmm. this, I had that. So when you are having really down times, you really need to look back on all the things. And I, I think that I actually do. And it was my old primary school teacher that um, that done this. And I'm still friends with her on Facebook and, and she's an amazing woman. Um, and Leslie says to me, when you're having down times, do me a favour, see any times you do things good and you get, you get people saying, well done and or had an amazing time at your charity event, you're doing amazing work, screenshot it on your phone. <laughs> and then see when you're having a bad time yet, look back on these messages. And you know what? It was probably one of the greatest bits of advice ever, because yeah. I do that. Um, and I'll probably do it when this gets released, and um, photos of today, that like beforehand and whatever, and, mm -hmm. and the journey to doing this today, I'll, I'll, I'll screenshot it and I'll... When I'm having a hard time, it I'll look back and I'll go, do you know what? Get a grip. Get a grip. You're 27. Have a word with yourself, son. Life's no rubbish. It's no crap. Just deal with it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and cheer you up. Yeah, mm -hmm. you'll look back on things and you'll have a tear and be emotional. But you'll, 
that's, that's great bit of advice. I, 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 yeah, I love that, and I, I still do it to this day. Yeah, that is brilliant advice. Yeah. <laughs> You've had an unbelievable amount of celebrity support. <laughs> um, I was looking at your Facebook page and going through all the videos of yeah. all these people. I was just like, had no idea. You know, yeah. unbelievable. Um, how does it feel to have had that support? I feel like I've won a watch, to be honest, because a lot of people pay for these videos. There's websites you can pay for stuff now. I've been cheeky. Like, <laughs> Mad Wagner that does videos, <laughs> he done me a video before he even started. I personally think <laughs> he owes me money <laughs> because I got in touch with him before he started doing all these happy birthdays and um, good good luck at your at your graduation videos <laughs> and all that. He he done a video for me a way back when I done my second fundraiser. He's standing in a gym asking people to support the event. So technically, I've made Wagner the person he is today because he's realised that there's money in it. <laughs> um, and it, it's great. I mean, the, the buzz you get. See see when you get a like you get in touch with through emails, the agents can they do this or we'll try and get them to do something for you. And um, what a buzz you get when you get the email through and there's a video attached and you're going, wow, they've mentioned my name. <laughs> uh, and, and you're like, this is, this is awesome. This is really, really good. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it works better than, if I, if I sat and videoed myself, nobody's going to like that on Facebook. Nobody's going to go, Who's, who's that fat Alan Carr look alike? Who does he think he is? <laughs> Whereas they're going to listen to people like Russell Martin who suffers from colitis and he's, he's the captain in Norwich um, City Football Club. Mm -hmm. They're going to listen to him. Mm -hmm. Ross King, who does the entertainment stuff for Good Morning Britain, he's sitting there with a Hollywood, Hollywood background and, and behind him talk, telling people to go along to my event. Mm -hmm. Ricky Hatton. You're not going to mess with Ricky Hatton. Yeah. <laughs> Alec McLeish, who, who's very close to the charity because um, he's got members of his family with the condition. Um, people are going to listen to them. Mm. No, going to maybe listen to me as much because <laughs> they don't know me. But it, it, and it gives a bit of buzz. It's like, wow, yeah. oh, that, look, look who's just done that for Stephen. And look who's just done that for the charity. And it, it, do you know what? It, it was my niche for a wee bit. I, I loved that. I, I loved releasing them on the page and... I love to see them getting shared because when people are sharing them, it's getting the word out there and it's mm -hmm. spreading. And you don't realise how how good social media is for that. It's, mm. it's, it's massive. Mm -hmm. It's like people that don't even know you. You're walking. I've I've had it. I was I was on holiday in Turkey one year, and somebody went, "You're the, you're the boy that's done all the stuff on Facebook." <laughs> wow. Um, one of the waiters in the hotel the second year I went back. You're very famous. Who? And I'm thinking, here we go, Alan Carr again, a Gok Wan. I'm like, oh my days. And I'm like, no, not chatty, man. And they're like, no, all the, you're all over Facebook. And you're like, wow. So it's, it's getting that wider audience. Yeah. And that's, that's and money can't buy, if you ask me. Absolutely. Um, sharing all that and, and getting, getting the word out there that money can't buy. And as I said, it all goes back to awareness. And, I think probably even to a certain extent, like you doing the interview today, you're probably more clued up in Crohn's and Clients than what you were before you 100%. before you started um, going to do this interview with me. Absolutely. So that it's doing its job. Yeah. It is doing its job. And, Definitely. And if, if you meet someone in the street and, and they tell you about your con their condition, then they don't need to feel as embarrassed because you kind of know a bit about it and you're like, well, I understand. I, I don't know the ins and outs, but... I'm, understand exactly. to, to a certain extent yeah and that's for me is that the job that, that i want to do and if i can make even just one person's life better uh -huh. and take the pressure off of them and use my experience to help them then i've done my job yeah absolutely mm -hmm. and I, I think often as well it's not necessarily understanding the science of the condition it's understanding the impact mm -hmm. or putting yourself in the other person's mm -hmm. shoes and understanding what it's like to live with yeah. that. It's like, do you know what? I, I use it in my day-to-day -day life at the minute, right? You see someone who is the laugh and the joker and they're all over the place, they're, they're, they're pulling rabbits out of a hat and they're getting you to smell and squish you with water <laughs> and they're, they're loving life. And then one day they're horrible to you, they're nasty, they're 
they're shutting off for you, they're pushing you away. That's when you need to rein it back in and go, look, what are they going through? Mm. What are they going through in their life? Why why have they went from being that to that? Mm -hmm. They're not doing it because they, they, they're, they're, they're a bad person. Mm -hmm. They're doing it because there must be something underlying. And that's what that's what Crohn's disease is like. Um, it does affect you, in my opinion, uh, I, I'm only going with my opinion because I've lived with it, it mm -hmm. affects you psychologically. Mm -hmm. um, and you can, uh, you can, like I am a roller coaster at times, I can go from at work in the office being the life and soul of the party to boom, I am I'm like, want to go into a corner and cry. Mm -hmm. um, not all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, not a lot, but it happens. Um, and I think with people understanding, not just IBD, but other, the, there is people out there that they may look normal, but everyone, everyone has got a different story. Yeah. Every person is born with a book. Everybody's got their autobiography. <laughs> yeah. Every autobiography is different. <laughs> and every chapter is different. And it's the same in life. So mm -hmm. people are going to be different. There are going to be times that they're struggling. And I think this is, as a culture and as people, we need to realise that people are different. People have hard times. Mm -hmm. It's what we do as the people round about that person to support them. Mm -hmm. It's, you need this, you need people round about you to, to, do, to understand that everyone is different. They're having a hard time right now. What am I going to do? to help them get through that hard time. Mm -hmm. And that that's the way I look at it. And that's why I, I pride myself on, I mean, people that know me, the, the guys from football, my assistant manager at football, he's like, do you know what? You, you're great at giving advice to people and you you inspire people, you motivate people, you do this, you do that. But then it comes to yourself and and you, you bring yourself down, you judge yourself, you, that's just the way I am. Mm. And I think it's partly because of the, the journey that I've been on that I'm very, I doubt myself, um, because you've not had that opportunity of certain things in life that other people have had. Um, so you do doubt yourself and you've been through that much hurt that it affects you. Um, but that's just, that's just me. It's just, yeah. um, I get a sense of a buzz and a, a sense of pride knowing that I've helped somebody knowing that they've had a right hard time yet and I've leaned out to them and, and put an arm and put a an arm around their shoulder and said you know what you're better than this you, you, you're better than this condition you're better than that bad performance at the football mm -hmm. you're better than that bad day you're having at work hmm. um, and then they go away and you see them improving and you go do you know what I've helped with that whereas I don't know if I allow people to do that with me. I kind of switch off. Mm -hmm. I kind of just like, well, I'm fine. I'm good. And I think it's something, if you ask anyone with um, a condition like myself, not just IBD, but it's a, it's a very common thing. People, how are you doing? I'm fine. Mm. I'm good. I'm fine. I'm yeah. fine. Mm, are you fine? <laughs> mm. Who knows? Um, but I think it's the whole coping mechanism and switching off at times, which isn't, always the best thing I think my advice to people would be open up talk to people yeah sometimes people are not going to give you the answers you want to hear but sometimes that's what you need yeah you need a kick up the backside sometimes mm -hmm. um and I think that's that's what I do for people mm -hmm. I don't allow people to do that for me at times and I think that's where I need to kind of adapt the way I deal with things mm -hmm. um and it's work in progress for me I, I'm getting slightly better um but mm. again as I said it's just me <laughs> yeah absolutely but but again, I think it's it's really good that you've got that level of self awareness to to recognise. Oh no, I, I know I know I'm hard work. Mm -hmm. I know <laughs> I'm I know I'm very hard work, and I shut people off, and I don't. I speak at the wrong times. I speak. Um, I open up at the wrong times. I I probably don't open up enough. I don't speak enough. I, as I said, I, I try and make sure everybody else around about me is okay before mm -hmm. I do myself. And mm -hmm. I'm not sitting here wanting to sound like, oh, he's such a selfless guy, and oh, he, he yeah. keeps loads of puppies, and he's a he's a gentle giant. That's not the the way I want to be perceived. It's just m my outlook is I, I always try and make sure that everyone else around about me is okay. Mm -hmm. But I know that's not great for me, mm -hmm. and I need to. Everybody needs to be a bit self selfish at times and and, oh, and rein it back in. You need to 
sometimes look after number one because if you don't look after number one number one's not going to be there to look after yeah so yeah. number one's no longer there and then there's, there's nothing absolutely so yeah I, remember, I can't remember who it was that said this to me but it was an analogy that um you know when you're crashing in an airplane you put your own oxygen mask on first mm -hmm. before you help other people mm -hmm. yeah. um, or you know kind of filling your own cup so that you have enough to give to other people mm -hmm. as well you always need to look after yourself yeah you're exactly because right. right. if, if you don't look after yourself you're not going to be there to look after other people that's it um and and you go in a decline and i have had times in my life that i felt i've, I've felt i've been going in a decline um, and i've shut myself off and i've not wanted to go out and socialize and be me mm -hmm. and it's horrible. It really is horrible. Um, and I don't talk much about it and about how I feel. Um, but um, what's good is being able to highlight it and know that this is my weak points, hmm. my areas for improvement, as yeah. you would say. Like, I, I do things like that at the football, areas for improvement, not what you're crap at, <laughs> but areas for improvement. Yeah. I think that's my area for improvement. Hmm. Stop doubting myself as much. And... Mm -hmm. Um, opening up a wee bit more um, to people because do you know what people do care yeah but you've got to let them care hmm. Hmm. so <laughs> you mentioned football a few times <laughs> how did you first get involved in it what's, and, uh, what, and, what, and what's been your uh, your kind of uh, career path well it's mental um, it is mental um, I started off a uh, semi-professional junior team being the first aider um, and I'd done that job from the age of 16. I'd done it for about 10 years. And I worked in dressing rooms with the players and worked with some great managers, um, some really, really good managers, um, and learned so much from them. Unfortunately, I didn't get to play because I was so ill. Mm -hmm. um, and like when there was football going on at the park and all that and teams, I just... I didn't have it in me. One, I was rank rotten in football. <laughs> I was I was terrible. Um, and two, I was just very, very ill. So I'm not putting it down to my illness that that's not why I was playing football. <laughs> I'm never going to turn around and say that I'm I'm like <laughs> the next Maradona. I was <laughs> I was rotten. Um, but again, I, I knew that. Um, so I learned from them, and um, it was my local my local side that I, I was at at the time. Um, started up a youth set up and it was an under 16 and I went along and trained a couple of training sessions for them because it's stuff that I'd learned over the years and I took a lot of things in standing in games and yeah your job is to assist with injuries and assist with the first aid side but you're taking in the coaching methods of the coaches that you're working with yeah. and you learn because that's that's the way you learn you, you learn you take the the positives out of people you take the negatives and don't do them. Yeah. And I started coaching at youth level. And I loved it. If I'm honest, I took a lot of stick for it. And it still, to this day, frustrates me. Mm. Um, you can see things as banter. And I always did. Uh, you take it as banter. But um, you're the first aider with all these adults, junior team, very good team. And then you start coaching at under 16s level, and then you get the, oh, who does Mourinho think he is? Because you've <laughs> never played football, and that's, that's what you get. And you take it as a joke to start with, and you take banter, because banter, dressing room banter, if you can't take a slagging in a football dressing room, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> but it continues. Mm -hmm. And it continues, and you hear things, and you hear things in the background, and you start to doubt yourself. Mm -hmm. Again, the doubt comes in, and what's maybe seen as banter with them, um, you start to take personal and it's like, maybe maybe they're right, maybe I had to play football, maybe I've not got a clue about football, maybe maybe I'm just doing something that I'm going to left, be left with egg in my face. But I went in and we coached in the first season, I'm working under the head coach, we won the league. We won the league. Um, and we won the Edinburgh League. So a team for West Lothian winning the Edinburgh League. So your Hutchie Vales and your Town Castles, we won that league that they were in at under-16 <laughs> level. So it's not just toddlers kicking a ball about. It's mm -hmm. under-16. Mm -hmm. Essentially, they're, they're adults, practically. Yeah. Um, second season, um, we went on in um, under-17s level. And I wasn't involved in the first aid anymore. The manager of um, the juniors 
had um, resigned from his position um, and me having worked with him for five and a half years and having the most respect for him ever um, because I think he's been he's been key to helping me out and I've learned a lot of him throughout the years. Um, Davey moved on. Um, I continued to be with the, the, the 17s um, and we went on and won two trophies, one being the South East Region, which is the second biggest cup from the the, um, the Scottish Cup and it's an amazing achievement. And I've done a lot of the hands-on coaching along with the head coach. I've done a lot of the hands-on coaching and a lot of the one-to-ones with the players. And I think it worked because I was close to their age as well. Mm -hmm. I'm 26 at that time. They're 16, 17. I go out at the weekend and I end up in some states, but I've never been to America. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and they're at that age that they're doing all these things. So. I'm quite good at advising at that point because I'm like, do you know what? I know what it's like to be your age, although a different part, but I'm living that now, so I know I feel that I'm close to your age. I can give advice. I can mm -hmm. say, like, do you know what? You're bang out of order and what you're doing and, and, and give the advice. And, and that's what I've done. And um, I got more involved in the, in, in, in the coaching side of it. So first aid was put in the back burner. And then... Um, I ended up getting into football management, which um, is a Sunday amateur team through in Glasgow. Um, but I was approached by the, the guy that started, they were a brand new club starting up. And he he approached me through, he basically knew of me through my charity work. And he says, do you know any coaches through in Glasgow? I says, no, no really. I says, but what I would be willing to do is come through and take a training session for you if you wanted. But I don't drive, so you need to sort of transport out for me, not a problem. And I get in and turned up first night, nine players, thinking, all right, okay, nine players, this is going to be interesting. Um, and he, he, he said to me, he said, I'd like you to be manager. But again, this is where the doubt sets in. Hmm. You hear people, you hear in your head again, you hear in your head, who does Mourinho think he is? Or what does he know about football? What does he know about played? What does he know? All of a sudden, he's went for putting a plaster on, he's thinking that he's going to be the manager of the Barcelona. No, no, it's that I've learned a lot off of people that I've worked with, and I've learned how to deal with people, man manage people. Am I, am I the greatest tactician in the world when it comes to football? No, because I've not actually played on the park and had it, been involved in it. Mm -hmm. But I've got a good level of knowledge for someone as young. And I thought, mm. so I asked questions, do you think I should do it? And everybody that I asked said, no. Nah, no, no, you should maybe just continue at youth level, blah, blah, blah. Because they thought that I was going to go in and people weren't going to respect me because he didn't play football. What does he know? He's he's only coached at youth level. What does he know? And Sunday, Sunday football sometimes gets slagged and they don't have the right attitude and fundamentals but I think it's as I said everything's different is there a written book on how to do things yeah exactly as I said to you before we came on air Michael Parkinson interviews <laughs> uh, Alan Carr uh, Graham Norton mm. they all do it different mm -hmm. you do your interviews different mm -hmm. is there the right way to do it wrong way no there's not mm. there's there's a way and if you can get people to buy into it then then you're doing it right so I eventually said, you know what, I'll take it. I got put together with an assistant manager if I wanted to keep him. Um, and w the club Eastwood Mairns through in Glasgow was formed. Um, and we've had a phenomenal response. The players we've had in, we've been getting 20-odd to 30-odd players at training. We've had that many people come in that we've started a second team. A development club, as you would like, um, and I know this is where the slaggings come in, that oh, it's Sunday football, the, where's the development going to come from? Well, do you know what? Sunday football is a wide range. There's people that can't play at a higher level because of work commitments. There's people that have maybe fell out of love of the game that, that need that love of the game installed back into them. Mm -hmm. And that's the way I'm going to go in and do things there. And we've went in, and although it's amateur football, we've went in and we've done kind of professional yet realistic expectations mm. we we have a fines list if the boys don't do things right if the 
sit but joking fine. So if your boots are dirty, it's a, it's a pound. And that all goes back into the players at Christmas time so they can go and have a night out. And I never ever thought I would I would see myself managing a football team. I really never ever thought. Um but when you know there's people out there that there's a mentality, I think, in this country, not just in this country, but people like to see people fail. Yeah. They like to see people fail. Mm. They they want to encourage and say, Oh the best, but really what what sometimes people are wanting is like, you know what, that's gonna that's gonna go peak tong for them and it's gonna go wrong. And it might go wrong for me. It might. It's very early stages. It might. We could be looking back on this interview in six weeks' time and my players have all turned against me and it's went wrong and it's not it's not worked. But what I will say is nobody ever you can't slag a guy that goes and tries something that that has got that much a love for the game and a that much a people person that wants to go and do their best and mm -hmm. do you know what? It's Sunday football and nine times out of ten a lot of people just turn up and expect to play and they don't train. I'll not do that at my club. Mm -hmm. What I'll do is I'll I'll have it structured. And if you have the fundamentals in place, who's to say that a player at the age of seventeen, eighteen that comes under my umbrella at the club doesn't then get picked up at a higher level and move on. Because do you know what? It's like people get put into high powered jobs. Um did Alan Sugar ever think he was going to be Alan Sugar? No. No. Did Richard Branson ever think when he opened up his record shop or whatever they done that he was going to be a multi a, a billionaire yeah, yeah. And, 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 and do what he did? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So for for anyone and looking at it and going, oh well, it's it's just this, it's just that. There's no rules. Go and do things to the best of your ability. I've got, I've got some great people round about me. Um, and that's why I've that's why I think the transition into being a manager has worked for me. Mm -hmm. I've got a wide range of players, mm -hmm. all from different backgrounds. I've got an assistant who is absolutely amazing at the fitness element, and the, he's, he's he's been to uni, he's doing all that. I do the try and do the motivation and the 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 of the players. Um, I'm very I'm very strict on them, but strict mm -hmm. in a good way because I because I want the best for them. Yeah, and I think that's how it's working. And mm -hmm. People that don't see how it's working and they don't see me physically managing the team and they don't see what I do behind closed doors and what I do when I'm at home to prepare my team. They just look at it as it's just another Sunday team. Well, not to me, it's not. Mm -hmm. It's a start for me. That club, that president, Paul, who, who's the president of the club, has basically started up a club and given the manager's job to a guy that has only coached at a youth level. He's never been a head coach. He's never played football, mm -hmm. but he's given me that opportunity. Yeah. And I'm like, well, do you know what? I'm going to make it work. Hmm. And I'm going to do everything. And do you know what? You can say it's Sunday football, it's this, it's that. I'm going to have standards. Yeah. And do you know what? See, if people don't want to adapt to the standards, they'll not be at my club and they'll not, they'll, mm -hmm. they'll not be part of it. Mm -hmm. um, if, you want to, if you want to try and better yourself, and do you know what? It might be the level that I'm at, and I'll be at this level of management, or it's maybe above me. I don't know. Hmm. Who knows? But what I will do is I'll, I'll give it my all and I'll use my experience, I'll use my connections to help me mm -hmm. along the way. And I'll make sure that the guys that are playing for me are, are saying to themselves, do you know what? I could go to any other amateur team and play every week and don't need to train and, and don't need to do this and can swear at the manager and do what I want because I know I'm getting a game. Mm. But I don't think players will think like that because, do you know what, see if they're getting their kits all hung up for them, if they're getting motivational team talks, mm -hmm. if they're getting told what to eat the night before and say, look, we can do diet sheets for you. Mm. We can make you, although you're not, but we can treat you like as professional as you want to be treated. Mm -hmm. And if you adapt to that and you embrace that, then we'll do everything we can to to make you a better football player and see if this is the level that we're stuck at, well, we'll do it to the highest level as we can. Absolutely. Um, and that's that's the way I, that's the way I want to do it. And I, it's not the norm. <laughs> Most people turn up half an hour before the, an amateur game and do a quick kick about with the ball and a warm up and get into a game. No, I'll not do that. I'll do it. I've came from a good background and worked with some great managers. Um, 
at a lot higher level than me, mm -hmm. a bigger knowledge than me, and I'll use that to the best of my ability to, to improve to improve players. And as I said, see if one person makes a step up to maybe senior or even playing a good level junior where they're getting paid to train and play two nights a week and play on a Saturday, mm -hmm. then I can go, do you know what? He's came through our ranks at that club. Mm -hmm. We've done something good. Mm. And it's the same with the awareness thing. Yeah. If you can help one person, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Great answer. Great answer. Stephen, I've loved speaking with you. Um, you know, finding out about all the work that you've been doing, um, you know, your football. I think that what you're doing and what you've done is truly inspirational. Thank you. And I think it's honestly fantastic. Um, and you're such a good advocate and representative of, um, you know, Crohn's and Colitis UK and the Thank work you. that you do in, in football as well. At this stage, as I like to do here, I'd like to go a little bit deeper with you. Yeah. Um, and handle, I suppose, some of the kind of bigger, more sort of philosophical uh, topics, if you like. The first that's a big word for a guy <laughs> for wrestling. <laughs> philosophical. Eh? Uh, until last year, I thought that started with an F. <laughs> <laughs> the, first, the first question that I've got for you is around about um, purpose. At this stage in your life, what do you feel is your, your purpose in life? Hmm. Um, I like that. <laughs> um, again, it's the, my purpose in life is to live it to the full, mm -hmm. to, to do things out with the norm, as a, not do things because everything's been done that way before. So, again, back into football, work-related, or this is the way things have been done for all these years. Mm. Right, okay. Is it right? Does it need to be done that way? No. Mm. No, I, I'll, I'll do things. And you know what? Again, if I do things wrong, it's egg in the face. But hey, <laughs> try things. So my, yeah. my purpose, mainly, is to life, live life to the full. To try to, to try and adapt to, to new ways of thinking. And, and, and also, again, and it comes back to the way I am, helping as many people as I can, mm -hmm. um, whether it be people that are suffering from the condition or whether it be lads at football that are going through uh, a tough time, at, uh, like mm -hmm. with the football. Mm -hmm. I don't just, just I don't just manage at football, in my opinion. I see it as a seven-day-a-week job. Um, as I do, I, I, I take pride in the work I do full-time, but also take pride in, in my purpose is to help people. Yeah to be there for people mm -hmm. um, and know that, do you know what, Stephen's there, or the football, or Gaffer's there, or Sharpie's there, they're, they're there for me, if I'm having a bad time, I can pick up the phone and speak to him, I'll give them advice, and, and that's that's the way I, I always want to be, mm -hmm. I'll never, ever, ever, shut, even, you, there's people that have, that have fell out of me, I've, I've not spoke to me in a while, and they would, if they came back to me tomorrow or, and they asked for help and advice, I'd give them it because yeah. I'm that type of person. Um, I maybe wouldn't give them it as best of my ability compared <laughs> to other people, <laughs> but I would I would give them and I would try and help them because yeah. that's that's what I want to do. I think that's, that's the main purpose for me is to, to help others. Hmm. What would you like your legacy to be? Hmm. Well, <laughs> um, certainly not a fat Alan Carr look alike, that's for sure. <laughs> um, my legacy. Um, I just want. I would like people to just look back and go. Do you know what? He, 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 everything he done, and he does. He does it to his best of his ability. Might not be as good as other people round about him, but he'll try. Mm -hmm. He'll he'll do everything to to make something work. Um, and he and he, um, I think that. Me and a guy, for, um, a guy that I, I drink with sometimes in the pub, we, we always have this saying, and he said it to me um, one of the times I was going in for surgery, and um, any time I had a hard time, it, he went, like, listen, son, never tap it. <laughs> and I want to be like the guy that never tapped it, the guy that, do you know what, he's had his knocks, he's had the, he's been slagged, he's, he's been, he's been looked down upon, and, who does he think he is and all, all that thing and the general life 
general life people be negative and mm. but I want people to look back and go, do you know what? There's one thing he'll not shy away from anything and he'll he'll put himself out there. Yeah. Just like doing this interview was putting himself out there. Um I don't mind putting myself out there and I want people to think that like, do you know what? He'll do things, he'll take up challenges that maybe not everybody would do. Because it's the same with the football, it's the same with work. Yeah. I could have lay back and said, you know what, I'm, I'm don't want to work, I've not got the confidence, so I, uh, I don't, I'm not going to try that, I'm not going to do that, because I'm, I'm not be any good at it. Mm. How do you know? Yeah. How do you know if you don't try it? So <laughs> that's what I kind of want people yeah. to look back on and go, you know what, he, give him his due, he, he, he gives things a try and he'll, he'll do everything to the best of his ability. Mm -hmm. but, but I think what's really interesting, being out of your comfort zone like that is where the biggest personal growth and emotional resilience comes from mm -hmm. and with everything that you've been through it's probably made you look at things like you 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 have a willingness to fail at things mm -hmm. because I'm, uh, you've been through a lot i'm going to fail I, I i'm <laughs> going to fail at times um failing as, as well it's the, the analogy is the first attempt in learning mm -hmm. um is fail um you're going to learn you get a no I know it's not a no, it's next opportunity. Mm. It's, it's, that, that's that's mm. what it is. And th these wee things are, um, are set, things are set to test you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's how you react and how you deal, you deal with things. And am I going to deal with things great 100% of the time? No. Am I going to be perfect at things 100% of the time? No. Um, am I going to make mistakes at the football? Yes. Am I going to make mistakes at work? Yes. Mm. Um, am I going to annoy people at times? Yes. But that's life and that's the way things are. Uh, and do you know what? See, if you're happy at doing something you're great at and you don't want to challenge yourself, then it's pretty sad, mm. in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, because I think everybody in life should go out with their comfort zone at, zone at one point. Whether it be, whether it be, oh, do you know what? I've never tried that food. Oh, I'm going to try it. Go and try it. Go and do something that you've never tried before. Go and try it. You might not like it, but at least you can go. Do you know what? I've tried. I've tried that. I've done that, um, and that's that's kind of the, the, the route I go down. Because as I said, I will make mistakes. Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I don't say I'm perfect. I'm not perfect. I will make mistakes. There will be people at one point will go. I told you so. You shouldn't have done that. I told you so. And I'll need to go to them with tail between my legs and go. Do you know what? You were right. But again. I think it says a lot about people when they're willing to go and try something. Yeah. And if it goes peat tall, then you hold your hands up and go, listen, it didn't work for me. Yeah. But next time, if I'm going to do something, I can use the experience for that when it didn't work <laughs> to make sure that it doesn't happen again. <laughs> and that's, that's the way I look at it. Yeah. How do you define success? Uh, defining success... It depends. It's a weird one. Because success to me might not be success to the person I'm standing next to the bus stop. Yeah. Success success to me, is success to um, some people is spreading a loaf pack butter on bread without <laughs> ripping it. That is success. Because <laughs> that's not an easy thing. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That, that, that could be success. Um, <laughs> success for me is, do you know what? I've I've had a roller coaster journey. Success for me is just to have a good life, live it to the full, learn from mistakes, and see what happens. I could win the lottery tomorrow and life's different, mm -hmm. or I could lose my job tomorrow or anything. But success, as long as as long as you're realistic to yourself, success. Is definitely going to happen no matter what. Mm -hmm. No matter what, as I said, whether it's just spread butter and loaf pack without breaking the bread. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's success. Um, but as a whole for myself, is just, do you know what? Settling down, finding a girlfriend, settling down. I've got my own house now. Settling down, continue to progress in my job, progress in my coaching, my management, um, and see where it takes me. But looking back and going, do you know what? Would I do anything different? Aye, maybe. But I've had a right good crack at the whip at it. <laughs> um, and I think you, you could sit here and go, oh, I want to be this, I want to be that, I want to do, I need to do this or I won't be successful. No, 
success happens every day. Mm. You will do something successful every day. Mm. Whether it be, uh, I don't know, anything, whether it be you go into your work and you do something good for your colleague, that's a success. Mm -hmm. Everything in life is a success. Yes, there's going to be things that don't go well, but for me, success happens every day. Hmm. There'll be something that is successful. There'll be there'll be ten things that have not been quite successful, but success is something that I think I think a lot of people get hung up on. Oh, I need to be this. I yeah. need to be that. Yeah. No, there's no book that you need to be this. You need to do that. You need to wear this. If we all done the same thing, we wouldn't uh, and all had the same outlook. We would hmm. be one weird, weird place. <laughs> yeah. But I, I I think sometimes when when people look at success they, they look at it as a more of a oh i need to be doing this i need to have a flashy car to do this mm. i need to i need to have this i need to have that no 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 rein it in rein <laughs> it right in do it at little small bite-sized chunks little small bite-sized chunks and that'll be successful and mm. the pieces of the puzzle will come together there's no point in cutting corners off the bits of the puzzle because <laughs> it's never going to go together. Just take it one step at a time and it might take you until 20 years down the line. But all those small successes will work yeah. if you work hard at it mm -hmm. and you just believe. Um, and that's that's basically my outlook on it, really. Great outlook. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to speak to your 20-year-old self, what would you say? Um don't have that last Jager bomb on a night out. <laughs> don't think it's acceptable that when you've been out all day you open up a bottle of red wine at one o'clock in the morning. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, do you know what I would do? I would say, don't doubt yourself. I know it's okay saying, because I do doubt myself all the time. Mm. Don't, don't doubt yourself. Um, believe in yourself. Um, stick two fingers up to the haters. People that will doubt you, people that will that will say you're this and that, ignore it. Yeah. Ignore it. De de when people bring you down, and I've not had a lot of it in my life, to be honest. I, I, I have and I haven't. I've switched off to a lot of it, and I've I've heard things, and because at school I probably at times until people knew how I was and how ill I was, I was maybe the weirdo that shut everybody off because I effectively was. Mm -hmm. But for me. Um, looking back and if I was to speak to myself back then I would say just go and be you don't worry too much about what people think of you mm -hmm. the people that matter to you will tell you how they feel about you hmm. the people that don't matter don't focus yourself on them because for a long time I focused myself on trying to please the wrong people Yeah, I yeah. want to be in that in crowd I want hmm. to be that I want to be this Mm. No, be yourself mm. because the people that care about you care about you as yourself. Yeah. Not these other people that probably don't care about you and deep down really just don't care. <laughs> so don't try and please people like that. Just be true to yourself mm -hmm. and, and live life to the full. Go and enjoy it. Oh, there's limits, of course there's limits. Um, but go and enjoy it and create memories, it's no address rehearsal, life's no address rehearsal, yeah. um, things can change just like that, I mean I thought I, I thought I had many more years with my grand being here, mm -hmm. and she died suddenly, don't allow it, go out, take pictures of everything, hmm. go on holidays, take pictures, go on nights out, take pictures, I know it sounds stupid, and it sounds weird, but come on, get in for a selfie, do it, and you know why you do it, because it's memories, it's yeah. memories you look back on, went on holiday with my dad there, and I normally, uh, and I've been going holiday, holiday with my dad for the last few years, and my dad this year probably ten more photos together than what we've ever done. Every time I see my auntie and the kids and my uncle, I get a photo with the kids. When I'm out now uh, at Christmas time and birthdays, I get photos with my mum, because I look back and I, I look back at my grand's thing and I go, "There's not enough photos. There's not enough photos." Because photos create memories. Yeah. So that's something I would tell to, to a 20-year-old me, a 21-year-old me. Mm -hmm. Take plenty of photos. <laughs> create memories. Look back on it. Yeah. Because do you know what? It'll be over before you know it. 
and it'll it'll creep up on you at the worst times because mm -hmm. that's what happens in life. Mm -hmm. Unfortunate things happen at times you're not expecting, mm -hmm. but that's life. So go out, enjoy it. As I say, take photos like I'm going to be doing today. I'm going to be <laughs> taking selfies. I'm going to be taking photos. <laughs> I'm going to be using this experience to look back on in a year's time and go, what a great day I had. What an amazing day. And, and when this goes out and it's shared all over social media, I'm going to go, this is going to make a difference. And mm -hmm. I can look back on it in <laughs> um, five, ten years' time and go, do you know what? What an experience that was. And I'll remember it just like it was yesterday because the photos there, yeah. the videos there, the pictures there. And I would say that to anybody, not even just myself. Mm -hmm. Go out, take plenty of photos, create memories because it's all about creating memories. Mm -hmm. And don't wait until it's too late mm -hmm. to create memories because I think people do that. Mm -hmm. I think people wait until... People wait until the, the worst times. They wait until people are diagnosed with severe illnesses or they've had hard times in their life. No, do it right for the word go. You can never, ever have too many memories. Mm -hmm. So go and create them and, and look back on them. I, I do it now. I get, I get my president in the football to take pictures of training sessions of me coaching, of me at the side of the park having a laugh with my assistant. Because you know what? I'll look back on them and six months when they sack me because I've been absolutely rotten at being a manager, <laughs> I can go, do you know what? At least we had a good laugh. <laughs> and it, and it, but it's memories and it, it mm. falls back into the thing that, that my, my, my primary seven teacher, Leslie, said to me. She said, make sure you, when you're having downtime, screenshot things that people send you. Yeah. Text messages. Messages from my players that um, that are thanking me for everything I've done for them so far and, and saying that they really enjoy working with me and um, compliments from my work colleagues and things like that. Mm -hmm. Look back on them and it's memories and that's what I would want anybody, not just if it was myself, I'd want anybody to do and I would encourage it. I'd yeah. encourage you, you today to, 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 to do it yeah. because I think it's, it's major. Hmm. And you know what? When you're having that horrible time when you're sitting in your room and you're having a horrible time there and the world's against you and everybody hates you and all that, you can look back and go, do you know what? I've done a lot. Hmm. I've seen a lot. I've been through a lot. And it's no bad. It's good. Hmm. I've got all this. Hmm. And that's that's my, my biggest thing at the minute. Yeah. If you could change anything in the world, what would it be and why? Hmm. People's people's um, outlooks. Again, it sounds mental, but this wanting people to fail. Yeah, I think we do. It sounds it sounds mental, but I think we do. And people might think I'm being negative sitting here saying this, but I actually do think at times people enjoy seeing people failing. They enjoy people going out and ice skating and falling and and on the backside because that's what they want to see. I, I've seen it in holiday there. I mean. Someone someone collapsed in front of me. I'm doing first aid to them. People are taking pictures. Because they, they, people get a buzz off of other people's misfortune. And I need to be honest. I've done it. I've laughed at the I've laughed at the the lady that's fell in the the old lady that's fell in the stairs. Mm. I've, everybody's done it. I, I, there's nobody out there that's never laughed at other people's misfortune. But I would like people if I could change, everybody's going to laugh at people's misfortune at times and have a laugh. Oh, they've just slipped on ice and all that. It's, it happens. It's natural. Mm -hmm. But I would like people to want to see other people doing well. Rather, like me, I want to see people doing well. Mm -hmm. um, again, sometimes more than I want to see myself do well, which again is what I need to change about myself. <laughs> but I wish people would just more have a more attitude of, I want to, like, do you know what? He's done really well for himself. Well done. Well done, rather than being jealous and going mm -hmm. off, look at, look at him, fancy car, big job. Oh, no, well done. Yeah. You've, worked, you've worked hard at that. Well done. Because um, I think we would all get on a lot better. Because I think that when, when jealousy creeps in and, and people get annoyed at seeing people do well, because I've probably had it as well. I probably, with the, the awareness stuff, some people probably get fed up seeing it. <laughs> Here's Stephen again. 
rather than going, well, do you know what? What's it doing here? Yeah. Ah, it's maybe a pain in the neck sometimes, but I don't need to read it all. I just need to know that he's trying to do a good thing. Mm -hmm. So that's what I'd quite like. If I could change that, I would. I would change that for the world. But I mean, it's probably never going to happen because <laughs> we're a very, very diverse uh, culture and diverse people yeah. in the world. Um, but in a real world, I'd quite like to see people being happier for other people. Yeah. Nobody, like, in my opinion, I don't like to see anybody at the low points because mm -hmm. I've been there. And I will be there again. There's no, I'm not going to say that my life's going to be perfect. But be happy for other people. Mm -hmm. And if I could, I would like to see people being happier for other people. Mm -hmm. Because I think it would, it would be great. Because if you know that someone's happy for you, you're more inclined to go and say to them, if you're having a down time, look, I need a bit of support. Mm -hmm. I need somebody to talk to. Because mm -hmm. you know that they're happy for everything you're doing good. They're going to support you for the things that aren't going so good. Yeah. So that's kind of what I would like to change. Yeah, fantastic answer. Brilliant. Stephen, I've had an amazing time speaking with you. Thank um, you. It's been such a, you know, I've really enjoyed the flow of the interview. Your answers have been absolutely on point, some brilliant stuff in there, some really good takeaways for people. And yeah, I think the work that you do is fantastic. So, you know, kudos to you. Keep, keep it up. Thanks for having me. It's been, it's been a great welcome. experience. <laughs> great stuff. Stephen, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Cheers.